Let's take a look at where the week is going with Congress and crypto and a dive into the SEC versus Ripple case with a new article that just posted in Forbes this morning talking about the SEC and their emails and the fight that they continue to wage against Ripple as a company and XRP holders as individuals. But if we haven't met before, my name is Frank Cho. I'm here to help you live a richer life. On this channel, we talk about cryptocurrency, personal finance, and investing. If you haven't hit that subscribe button, do it now. That way I can keep you informed of all the latest news and updates. Let's take a quick look at the crypto market before we dive in. We're down about 1.6% on the day at $1.81 trillion. Having picked back up overnight, it had dipped below that one8 mark. But Bitcoin right at 39000 Ethereum a hair under 2900 XRP still under that 70 cent mark at 66 cents down 5% on the day 10% on the seven day with a significant pullback there you can see other alts down about 3% to start off the week now just a quick reminder uh, from treasury here on twitter so at treasury xrpl if you are a treasury nft bond holder uh, you are probably at or soon to reach the maturity date they had their initial drop for the top 100 holders so if you happen to be one of those people they do have the procedure listed on twitter here which i'll link in the video description for you to be able to redeem that nft bond for the treasury payout due to you uh, at its maturity so those directions will be linked down below it's a really easy process all you have to do is if you use a, a some app you just send it back to who sent it to you to that address or alternatively they have the address posted uh, if you can't find that transaction for you to send it back so really easy uh, steps to follow but the step-by-step -step directions will be in the video description now courtesy of ron hammond as we like to do we'll start the week off with what's happening in congress and crypto so this week there's actually quite a bit happening in dc we've got hearings with the directors of the consumer financial protection bureau and FinCEN, the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, and a hearing on the role of digital wallets. While these aren't necessarily uh, crypto-focused, they'll likely have mentions of cryptocurrency and some of the implications uh, to the different things happening from that executive order from Biden. So the major news, though, is from Patrick McHenry, who we have seen to be an advocate for crypto. So today in an interview, Financial Services Committee ranking member, this is, of course, in the House, uh, Rep. McHenry announced he will likely stay as chair of the committee if the Republicans take back the House in November. This has major implications for crypto policy. So right now he's the ranking member, which makes him kind of the number two. He's the head of the party that's the minority in this committee. Uh, Maxine Waters is the chair. So if the Republicans in the House uh, had the majority, he would then stay in the committee, but as the chair. Uh, why would this be good or bad? Well, he'll explain further. If you've seen the hearings before, you'll understand some of this uh, already from the get-go. So Reb McHenry has a has been a bipartisan champion of fintech and crypto issues for quite some time. Notable legislation includes the bipartisan fix to the broad language in the infrastructure bill around the definition of a broker and various reporting requirements. Should he go to leadership in 2023 when the Republicans likely take back the House? The Financial Services Committee chair would have been one of a variety of FSC members who would be well qualified but not share the personal passion for crypto. This is important because chairs dictate the agenda, uh, the especially in the House, which is ruled by just a simple majority. The chair of the committee has a lot of leeway in terms of what their legislative focus will be in the Congress. Every member has his or her set of priorities. For example, Chair Waters, who's in the position right now, is housing, holding banks accountable, and more. Uh, then you have the chair working with members on the other side of the aisle, usually to ensure there are some common issues to work on. This includes oversight of agencies and larger pressing matters. For example, Robinhood, when that was a, a big deal last year, uh, Libra, credit rating agencies, flood insurance, the economy, 
and more. The power lies with the chair of the committee. McHenry has a good track record of working with the other side of the aisle on a variety of fronts, including crypto. This will be important because regardless of what happens in November with the House, the Biden administration is staying put. The interesting dynamic will be how the battle for control of the Senate plays out in November. Some experts are now forecasting a lean R for the Senate, meaning a slight Republican uh, advantage or majority. This has serious ramifications for the Biden agenda on a number of fronts, especially in financial services. Most speculate that Senator Tim Scott would be the chair of the Senate Banking Committee should, and that's still a big if, the Republicans take the Senate. That would be taking the role that uh, Sherrod Brown, who is definitely opposed to cryptos, uh, currently holds. Senator Scott has a policy focus on opportunity zones, housing, financial inclusion, and much more. In the past, he hasn't engaged much on crypto. However, he would certainly be a better fit uh, than Brown, who is very close-minded. I personally would rather see uh, Toomey take that role were uh, the Republicans to win in the Senate there. Uh, just I think he's a better fit, and we've seen him be a significant advocate for crypto so far, at least from that Senate banking committee. Uh, he would be a great fit, in my personal opinion, uh, just from his positions that he's expressed, the questioning, and the fact that he has not hesitated to uh, come after Gary Gensler and try and hold him accountable. Uh, having him in a more significant role there, I think, would uh, definitely help increase that uh, level of accountability for the SEC, which, as we're going to talk about in a minute from the Forbes article, is long past due. However, here, continuing, Senate banking has many Republicans engaged on crypto legislation, including Senators Lemus, Daines, Haggerty, uh, Tillis, and Rounds. Even if the Republicans have all of Congress, they will still need bipartisan support if they want to work with the Biden administration. With this announcement from Representative McHenry, though, we can expect more legislative action on crypto in 23 and 24. The path forward, though, still requires support from both sides. And with an administration already working on the crypto executive order, it is important crypto remains bipartisan. So again, we don't talk politics heavily here, only in the context of how it relates to crypto legislation. And uh, as such, I think that that really needs to be the, the pattern we see here. This shouldn't be a political issue. Uh, crypto has many benefits for people of all walks of life, all political views and affiliations. And so uh, because of that, we need to keep some of the politicking out of it. That's been a significant problem that we've seen over the last year as people try and politicize it, try and characterize crypto as being used for nefarious purposes uh, rather than focusing on the benefits. They highlight only the risks. So let's depoliticize crypto and start focusing on the benefits that it can bring. Now, in Forbes, again, just posted within the last hour uh, at the time of this recording, this is from Rosalind Layton, who we've seen contribute significantly here uh, on articles relating to the SEC versus Ripple case, as well as specific callouts against some of the bad actions coming out of the SEC. So this is a short one, a nice recap in case you've missed a few of the things happening lately, and then really again calling out the SEC for some other actions in a major media outlet here. So let's take a dive through this. It's a short one, but good. The SEC has lorded the sword of Damocles over fintech for years. It has used the blunt force of regulation by enforcement to make de facto rules against innovative companies rather than following the notice and comment steps required by the 1948 Administrative Procedure Act. Its lawsuits against Kik, Telegram, and most famously Ripple shows the sledgehammer wielded for quick settlements that avoid judicial tests. But dozens of emails, if compelled by the court, could bring the agency's reckoning. The SEC took it too far with Ripple, accusing the enterprise blockchain company of failing to register the, dig the digital asset XRP as a security since 2013, even though it duly operates as a bona fide bridge currency. Exchanges immediately dropped trading of the currency XRP and investors lost billions of dollars in value. The SEC's flippant decision stoked a class action firestorm from the ferocious decentralized XRP community. To justify its actions in court, the SEC has leaned heavily on the so-called Howey test that an asset is a security 
if its value is derived by the actions of a third party. Fintech policy scholars debate whether the Supreme Court case about shares in Florida orange groves in the 1940s is applicable to blockchains and cryptocurrency. Now, pausing a second, if you missed yesterday's episode of the Frank Cho Crypto Show, I'll link it down below and up in the top right-hand corner. We talked specifically about the Howey test, also about the Reeves test, but if you want to hear more on the Howey test specifically, we, we, we went through that in a, a lot of detail. Continuing here, uh, Ripple has attacked the SEC's thin reasoning and challenged the due process of retroactively or retroactive illegality in a climate of regulatory confusion that the agency itself created. Central to Ripple's defense is a 2018 speech delivered by then SEC Director of Corporation Finance Bill Hinman, in which he declared that Ether, the native currency to Ethereum, issued a high profile or issued in a high-profile ICO in 2014, was no longer a security as it became, quote, sufficiently decentralized over time, despite boilerplate disclaimers that the speech was his own opinion and not necessarily that of the commission. The market interpreted the speech as regulatory guidance. Even Hinman and then-SEC Chair Jay Clayton said publicly that this speech reflected the SEC view. Ripple, the exchange Coinbase, and others sought clearer guidance from the SEC to no avail. The best conclusion was that the SEC gave Ether a, th a free pass and that the same logic, if applied to XRP, would make it a currency. Ripple never had an ICO, and its network was fully built and decentralized before a single token sale took place. Wisely... Ripple demanded that the SEC provide some 70 emails circulated within the agency about the infamous speech. The SEC has, has fought a long, desperate battle to keep the emails confidential as part of its obfuscation of discovery and even issued an 11th hour expert report on the last day of discovery. For this, the court slapped down the SEC, ordering it to pay the defendant's expenses and the cost of redeposing an expert witness. The court stated the SEC has conducted itself improperly by serving an unauthorized supplement on the last day of discovery. For that, the SEC is ordered to pay defendants reasonable expenses in filing their motion to strike and redeposing Dr. Metz, the party's prior agreement that each side shall cover the costs of their own experts' time shall control. Accordingly, the SEC shall also cover the costs of Dr. Metz's time. I'll link the video going through that order in full detail down below and up top as well, so you can reference that in full if you so desire. In parallel, though, the XRP Army has organized into a putative class of over 65,000 retail XRP holders, led by friend of the court John Deaton. They've crowdsourced an investigation of evidence that Hinman, while at the SEC, earned $15 million in retirement benefits from Simpson Thatcher, a law firm linked to Ethereum. This conflict of interest has also won the attention of Empower Oversight, a nonprofit legal watchdog which filed a raft of Freedom of Information Act requests. Such conflicts forced Clayton's predecessor, Mary Jo White, to recuse herself from more than four dozen enforcement actions. Adding yet another lawsuit against the agency, the Watchdog's Freedom of Information Act requests have hit pay dirt. Despite SEC claims that no relevant emails existed, these incriminating emails show the SEC's lengthy process to explain away the unseemly payments to Hinman, including a memo by SEC Ethics Council and repeated war warnings on criminal financial conduct. Such brazen conduct is business as usual at the SEC. Outraged investors and consumers now seek justice in court, providing the reckoning that Congress should have imposed. This blasé acceptance to agency overreach could punish lawmakers in November. So there you go. Everything we've seen over the last couple of weeks encapsulated in a single place in Forbes, which is great to see, again, more mainstream media attention being paid to this case. Uh, you can see the SEC has continued with their brazen uh, acts at trying to keep information from the public, trying to protect individuals who acted recklessly at best, uh, criminally at worst, and we're starting to see the dominoes fall where the accountability 
is uh, moving forward. The FOIA requests from Empower Oversight are uncovering more things happening. Uh, that was quite the discovery over the course of the last couple weeks here with the SEC Ethics Council, which brings into question the actions uh, that Hinman did even further than they already were questionable. So much more to come in this case as we roll along now with an even more extended timeline, but we will continue to follow it and keep the updates flowing. I hope you found the information here to be helpful. If you did, hit that like button for the YouTube algorithm. It helps the channel a ton and make sure you get the information most important to you. As always, hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. That way I can keep you up to date on all the latest news and updates. Thank you so much for spending some of your time here with me. I do truly appreciate it. Have a fantastic rest of your day and start to the week. And I will see you in the next one.